Marcus Banks, thank you very much for um, agreeing to um, talk to us about your approach to um, visual research. Okay. Um, and I wanted to ask you really to imagine that I was a, a starter researcher, beginning the process of designing my own study, and I'm thinking of using visual methods myself. And, and really, what advice would you give to me, imagining this perhaps is my first supervision or something mm. like that? Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when you think about the project itself and what is required from it, the, the particular methods to be employed should identify themselves or should become obvious with reading and, and discussion, etc. But it's difficult for me to think of a project that couldn't benefit from the use of some kind of visual methodology. It may not benefit a great deal, and then there may be other projects that benefit tremendously. Um, but it's still worth remembering that all methods have to be used as, you know, as part of a suite as a, in, in conjunction with other methods. There's nothing so distinctive about visual methods that they could sustain an entire research uh, agenda. So what do you get from the visual that you don't get from normal qualitative or quantitative data? I think there's two things really. First of all, a lot of people using visual methods are using them to either bypass language or add an additional channel of information, channel of understanding to language. Uh, that obviously is particularly relevant in cases where the research subject's use of language may be restricted in some way. They may be poor and uneducated and lack, as it were, the sophisticated vocabulary to talk about things. They may be children, they may be people with um, some kind of mental or physical impairment that prevents, again, expressing themselves fully through language. But it may also be that some people are just less comfortable with talking, especially about themselves, for example, and find that talking perhaps about a third-party object, for example, a photograph as used in photo visitation, relieves that, that burden of intense kind of scrutiny of the self. They can displace things they want to say about themselves or say about that community onto a discussion about an image that's being shown to them by the researcher. Um, it also allows people to talk about things that may be politically unacceptable um, for, or socially unacceptable, so that women may, in some societies, may not feel that their voice in, is entitled to be heard, but by talking about an image, or perhaps by presenting images, uh, can say things they might not otherwise feel comfortable putting into words. So there's certainly that aspect. Um, you, the use of images, whether made by the researcher or made by or consumed by the people you're studying, as a way of, of sidestepping language. The other use, I think, is... Um, and this is particularly uh, coming to the fore in, in anthropology and other disciplines that are influenced by phenomenological perspectives, is as another route into accessing people's interior worlds. Um, again, it's partly this business about what can and cannot be put into language, but it's also partly there are various visual methodologies that are used to help the researcher get closer to seeing the world in a metaphorical sense as their research subjects see the world. Uh, so there's a particular line of inquiry going on in anthropology, sociology at the moment, about so-called skilled vision, how people in particular professions or uh, particular sectors of society have developed specialised or, or um, very refined ways of viewing either the entire world or some part of the, the physical or social world, and using a camera to, as it were, mimic that sense of the world that these people have to, for example, keep taking pictures of something and saying, is this how you see it? And they're saying, no, no, you don't do it like that, you do it like this. Using a constant sort of iterative process of image making, image discussion, to get the researcher to a position where they actually feel in some small sense they're almost seeing through the eyes of the people they're working with. Uh, visual methodologies are obviously crucial for this. Are we not changing the world if we're taking pictures of the world? I think not in the significant sense in the sense that all research activity, or almost all research activity, takes place, or rather is crafted, before the people on whom the research is done know about it. That is to say, we as social researchers pitch up in a classroom, pitch up in a village in Africa, wherever it is, and tell people we're going to do research. Uh, very rare are the instances where research subjects contact social scientists and say, please do some research on us. So in the sense that all research is an imposition on other people and therefore alters their world in some way, there's somebody living amongst them or spending time with them who wasn't <coughs> previously doing so, introducing a few images into that, making a video, whatever else it is, I don't think is really a very significant addition. 
So if I look forward as a, as a researcher and I'm going to do this study, do I then have to think about the end point? How, how might I be storing my data? How might I be ultimately presenting my data? Is, is, is it just going to be a research report, like a normal research report, or do I need to do something else? You do, or at least in terms of thinking the, through these issues at the outset to be prepared for what you're going to face at the end. I mean, I suppose there are two sets of issues. The first is the practical, technical, technological aspect. If you're taking digital images, do you have somewhere secure to store them, all those kinds of things? Uh, and obviously that is very contingent. It's a very fast-changing world in terms of how material is stored and accessed, etc., whether it's on the web or through blogs or whatever. Um, more particularly, I suppose more interestingly for me as a social scientist, is what the status of any images that you create or collect is uh, in the eyes of the people you've been working with, as well as in the eyes of others. Um, are people happy, for example, for you to retain a set of images of them taken possibly at a time of some distress or, or uh, unhappiness if, if one's working on, as my anthropological colleagues may do, on, on say, mortuary rituals. You've got a lot of photographs of people being very unhappy at funerals. Are they happy for you to hold on to those images many years later and, and use them in publications, etc.? So there's a sort of quasi-ethical, moral uh, dimension about the status of the images that you create. I mean, there are quite real ethical issues too about negotiating um, the permission of people to redeploy images that you've taken off them in, in other contexts, in academic publications, in exhibitions, in lectures, etc., etc. Um, but there's also other ways of, of thinking through the, the visual data that you will generate or collect. I mean, for example, in, in some contexts, people want to make a film. They don't want to just take video footage that will be used for some kind of conversation analysis or whatever. They actually want to use the one, two, ten, twenty hours of video footage to craft it into a, a, an authored representation that has a kind of beginning, a middle, and an end. But if you even dimly suspect that you're going to want to do that, and that your part, at least, of your final uh, research presentation will be a movie as well as a, a book or a thesis or whatever, that's something that certainly needs to be thought through at the outset, not something you can pick up your video footage at the end and think, I wonder if there's a film in here. I mean, maybe, but it's kind of unlikely. Films in that sense have to be thought out from the beginning. Marcus Banks, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you.